So, hi, I'm Bill Mosley. I'm a geography professor at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. And this lecture relates to AP Human Geography Unit 5 on agriculture and rural land use. And what I'm going to be sharing with you today is the result of five years of research that I've been doing in Burkina Faso with collaborators. And in particular, we're looking at the impacts of a new green revolution for Africa rice project on participating women's nutrition and food security. So I'm going to start with a little bit of introduction and context. Uh, talk about the original Green Revolution, which you would have covered in your unit, how that transitions to the new Green Revolution for Africa. I'll give you some background on Burkina Faso, then we'll get into the specific research questions and the methods we use to address those questions. Then we'll share our findings, and then I'll conclude. So, the first Green Revolution uh, happens in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. There's a concern uh, on the part of Western countries that because of population growth, um, that they're not producing enough food to meet their needs. And in particular, there's concern about potential social unrest. This also happens to be the era of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. And Western nations are concerned that if people are hungry, it's more likely that they will slide into socialism. So this effort was led by a number of West, Western countries, the United States at the lead. The idea was to develop improved seeds uh, and introduce these with a package of pesticides and fertilizers in order to boost yields. In particular, they focused on wheat varieties and uh, rice varieties, especially um, uh, irrigated or flooded rice varieties. And it's regarded to have been quite successful in Latin America, South Asia, Southeast Asia. These are photos I took in Maharashtra state uh, in India a few years ago, where the Green Revolution had a big impact uh, in India more broadly. They grow a lot of wheat in the northern part of the country and a lot of rice in the southern part of the country. And along with these new technologies, we saw a fair bit of uh, mechanization as uh, indicated by this use of a tractor here on the right. Now, this first green revolution um, is largely thought to have bypassed Africa because they focused on crops, wheat and rice that are not commonly um, uh, cultivated in the African context. There's not much uh, wheat that's grown and the rice varieties that are grown are more rain fed rice varieties um, not the flooded rice. The Green Revolution, while it's widely regarded to have been a success and in terms of improving yields, there were uh, social and environmental costs associated with it. Because it took means, it took resources to adopt improved seeds, pesticides, and fertilizers, it's largely wealthier farmers who adopted these and poor farmers could not. This leads to increasing social differentiation between wealthy and poor farmers and an increasing number of small farmers, and this is an encampment of landless um, uh, peasants in rural areas in India, who now have to work on the farms of wealthier farmers, or in some instances, they left the land entirely and migrated to the city. On the environmental front, there are two main problems. One had to do with a phenomenon known as pesticide resistance. Basically, insects pass their developing resistance to commonly used pesticides, and you have to use more and more of them to get the same effect, or you have to develop entirely new types of pesticides. Also, there were a number of issues associated with irrigation, as represented by this picture of a dam on the right. Large numbers of dams were built in order to provide irrigation for this floodplain rice. This disrupts rivers and the aquatic ecology in them. And then there were also problems in the rice fields, particularly if they were improperly drained. This leads to a problem known as salinization. A more fundamental critique is the idea that the hunger at the time was not really a supply problem. It had more to do with poor people's access to uh, adequate amounts of food. In here, the thinking of Amartya Sen, who's a, a Nobel laureate, uh, an economist from India, 
his ideas about food entitlements are really useful. So Sen makes this important distinction between food availability, how much food is on the market, and food access. What is people's ability to access that food, which he frames in terms of entitlements. What are people's legal entitlements to food? They can produce it on their own farms, they can well, with income, or they can uh, uh, be gifted food from um, neighbors and family in a, in a difficult period. And what Sen argues is that most famines are about entitlement failure, right? It's not necessarily a, a production problem. And this is really useful for understanding the history of famines. For example, in the 1970s, there's a widespread famine in Sahelian and West Africa. And at the same time, there's a famine going on. They are exporting peanuts, which are a nutrient rich food um, uh, that's made into local sauces. But the problem was that local people couldn't afford it. And basically they're being exported because people in other parts of the world can outbid them for, for those resources. Now, how do we transition from that first green revolution to the new green revolution for Africa? 50s, 60s, and 70s, there's this focus on food production symbolized by this first green revolution. There's a period in the 80s and 90s where we pivot away from the emphasis on food production and focus much more on trade. And the idea is that countries in the global south can produce commodities, cotton, tea, coffee, cacao, and trade those for food. And in the 80s and 90s, this seemed to work relatively well. Prices were somewhat low and stable. So this is an, a, a graph of the FAO food price index, um, which is the average uh, price for food. There are two lines on this graph, nominal prices of food, basically what people were paying for food at the time. And it, you see it looks like it's increasing over time. But then we have real food prices in the yellow line here, which are adjusted for inflation. And so we have relatively high prices in the 60s and 70s, the time you know, that the Green Revolution was trying to address. Then we have low stable prices in the 80s and 90s. But beginning in the early 2000s, food prices begin to creep up. And in 2007, 2006, food prices go up an average of 50%. And this is a particular problem for the urban poor um, who spend a disproportionate amount of their money on food and now they're really squeezed. And this leads to a series of food demonstrations, also known as food riots. Uh, I'm not too keen on the term food riot because it kind of connotes mad dogs fighting over food. Food demonstrations, it's more thoughtful. It's about people protesting the policies that got them in this situation in the first place. And you'll notice if you look at this map of food demonstrations around the world, there's a particular cluster of these in Africa. And so this really caught the attention of public officials, especially governments in Africa, donors. They're concerned about this social unrest. We have to address this problem. So this leads to a pivot back to a focus on production. And now this is framed as the new green revolution for Africa. So why this particular approach? Well, there's a concern about hunger and the largest number of hungry people in the world are actually found in South Asia. But if you look at it in terms of prevalency, what proportion of the population is facing hunger? Africa is the place where you have the highest prevalency rate. We also have a situation where African subsistence farmers are framed as a problem, that they need to engage with the market more, adopt improved technologies so they can become more export oriented. And so the solution here is the new green revolution for Africa, which is similar in some ways to the first green revolution. There's this emphasis on exogenous technology, bringing in from the outside improved seeds, pesticides and fertilizers, but it's also different in some ways. One is this focus on the market and connecting small producers to the global market. And they do this conceptually through something known as a value chain. So I have a value chain on the bottom here. Farmers are in the center of this. And think of it as a linear set of linkages between different actors in this chain that connects farmers to a global market. And so we have input suppliers who provide the seeds, the pesticides and fertilizers to the farmers who are now producing a surplus. This is processed by agro-processors and grain millers, which is then sold to retailers, and then eventually it makes its way to consumers. So integral to these value chains 
are private actors. So unlike the first Green Revolution, which really was about governments and multilateral agencies like the UN, this new Green Revolution for Africa, government is actively working with private sector actors, with businesses, uh, all along this value chain. There's a big focus on efficiency, on producing more. We're going to sort of pilot certain approaches in one small area, and then we're going to scale up and move out to lots of different areas. There's also an increasing focus on women. There's a recognition that in the African context, by some estimates, women produce 70% of the food. So you can't sidestep women. They have to be actively involved in this new approach. So let's now explore how this plays out in Burkina Faso. And I need to give you a little bit of background information on Burkina Faso. So Burkina Faso is a former French colony. It got independence in 1960. It was originally known as Upper Volta because of uh, different branches of the Volta River that flow through the country. That name changed in the 1980s uh, to Burkina Faso. It had a long running dictator, Blaise Compaore, who ruled from about 1987 to 2014. There were popular uprisings. Uh, he was forced out of power. There were democratic elections. And since 2015, uh, Roche Kabori has been the president of the country. With this sort of shift to democratic um, uh, um, governing, more donors came into the country and including the New Green Revolution for Africa under the guise of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, otherwise known as AGRA, which is supported by the Gates Foundation in the United States. And here they encounter a country which is largely agricultural based, 73% of the countries involved in agriculture but they're also facing serious problems. 45% of the population living below the poverty line, 26% of children are underweight. Now, it's a largely rural country, but it has big cities, including Ouagadougou. And I just wanna share with you this brief video that I took in the summer of 2019 when I was in Burkina doing research and I'm narrating um, kind of as we're, we're driving around the city. Bill Mosley, and I'm a geography professor at McAllister College in the U.S. And we're here in Ouagadougou, uh, which is the capital city of the West African country of Burkina Faso. This is a city of about 3 million people. Uh, the population of the country is around 18 million. And oftentimes there's a misperception that uh, Africa is rural, and it's important to remember that uh, there are big cities, uh, and in fact, uh, the continent has the highest urbanization rate in the world. Okay. Now, Agra and its projects are moving into Burkina Faso and they encounter sort of two different agricultural development trajectories. The first is one focused on self-sufficiency, agroecology and agroforestry. It's often associated with a left-leaning political leader in the 1980s known as Thomas Sankara. And he was very keen to um, make his country less dependent on imports from other countries to boost self-sufficiency, including, including food production. And the way he went about that was through the science of agroecology. So rather than using pesticides and fertilizers, focus on the ecology that's happening in farm fields, creative intercropping the combination of different crops, as well as agroforestry, the planting of trees and fields, and this is demonstrated by this background photo, in order to boost production. The other sort of agricultural development tradition or trajectory is one which is much more export-oriented, um, dependent on inputs, uh, the sale of commodities. And this is associated with Blaise Compaore, that former dictator that I just um, um, shared with you. And clearly, um, the New Green Revolution for Africa dovetails nicely with this second tradition and sort of bolsters that second tradition. Now, it's not to say there are not problems with this. Let me just give you two brief examples. Burkina Faso has commonly been the lead exporter of cotton on the African continent. They were an early uh, technology of um, GMO cotton, genetically modified organisms, uh, specifically BT cotton. This was heralded as a great success, but then it ran into serious problems, declining quality of the cotton, and they abandoned this technology. 
Also, we have a peculiar phenomenon where the wealthiest part of the country, wealthiest rural area where they produce a lot of this cotton, there are alarmingly high rates of child malnutrition and food insecurity, which means that people are not spending this surplus income on food and nutrition. Okay, specific questions. What's the nature of this rice value chain? I talked about the value chain earlier. This New Green Revolution for Africa rice project. Let's talk about the different actors on this value chain. Then we'll look at the village level and how it's impacting food security and dietary diversity amongst participating women. And then lastly, I wanna talk about some other things that are going on at the village level, specifically foraging and herbicide use. This is research that has been done uh, with students and I wanna highlight their work. In terms of research design, uh, here's a map of Burkina Faso. This is the Southwestern part of the country. This is Bobo Jalasso, the second largest uh, uh, city in the country, about a half million people. And we're working in five different villages, north and south of this city. Two to three of these villages are actively involved in this project, Medina Kora to the north, uh, Yegere and then Saki was initially in the project and then they dropped out. And then we have two control villages where the project is not working, Segere and Sinyana. So we have kind of th three different groups of people that we were interviewing, those who are in the project, in the project village. And then in project village, some women who are not involved in the project and then these control villages. In terms of methods, in 2016, we did baseline surveys. One of the main things we were interested in was wealth. And on the bottom here, we have a graph of our different households and the women we interviewed. And basically we have a group of poor women, a poor of intermediate wealth women and a, and a group of wealthy women. 2017, 2019, we did two rounds of surveys in each year. We looked at the first period, which was June, July. This is sometimes referred to as the hungry season. It's actually the rainy season when people are working in the fields, but it's before the harvest. And so it's a difficult time. And then we did surveys in December, January, after the harvest, when in theory, food is more plentiful. We asked two sets of questions uh, when we were doing these surveys in 2017, 2019. One was, a 24 hour recall, we would interview the woman, what are all the things you have eaten personally over the last 24 hours? And what are the things that your family has uh, uh, consumed in order to calculate a dietary diversity score? Basically, we sort these different foods into food groups and you can come up with a score. The other thing we did was calculate, ask a series of questions so that we could calculate the household food insecurity access scale. Now, this is a range of questions that we ask what's been going on over the past four weeks. They range in severity on the more mild side is, you know, how often have you worried that you wouldn't have enough food? More severe is, you know, how many times has there been a 24 hour period when you and your family have eaten absolutely nothing? And based on this, you calculate a score of one to four. Four is more food insecure, one is, is better off, more food secure. Now, when working in the, in the village and geographers in general who do field work, it's really important to master different languages to enable that field work. So if you're a budding geographer and you're, you're thinking about going into this field, I highly encourage you to keep up with your second language study. I personally work in three different languages. I often use English to communicate with my American students. I use French to communicate with civil servants and government officials. And then I speak a local language that I learned previously when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali. And they speak the same language, fortunately, in this area. And I use this to communicate with local people. So I'm gonna play, with, play here a short video. I'm talking to the village chief, introducing the project. I'll talk about it in, in English. Then I'll talk about it in French. Then I'll talk about it in the local language, Bomber or Jula. And then the chief responds to me, basically saying he's very happy to be working with us. Hi, I'm Bill Mosley, and I'm here in southwestern Burkina Faso in the village of Medina Kuro. I'm a geography professor at McAllister College, and we've been working in this community for the past five years 
studying the nutritional impacts of a rice project. Bonjour, moi je m'appelle Bill Mosley, je suis un professeur de géographie à l'Université de McAllister aux États-Unis. Et nous sommes là à Madina Kura, dans le sud-ouest de Burkina Faso, où nous travaillons depuis cinq ans sur les impacts nutritionnels d'un projet de riz. Aniche, Netogo Bill, Bill Mosley, né à l'Université Karamogoye, Mitogo McAllister, Mibesora, Amérique là. En Béyan, Medina Kura, ni Dugu Abesoro, Burkina Faso, Jamarala, et Wardugu Fanfela, Ani Tilebi Fanfela. En Bé Barakeyan, Abe Sanduru Bossisan, En Bé Nienengalike Moussofe, Ka Kibaru Soro, Mi Bé Malosene, Na Abu Deme, Dumini Fanfela. Aïwa, Dugu Tigi. Ani Tchè, Ani Tchè, Abarka. So in addition to these interviews that we're doing at the village level, we're also interviewing other actors all along the value chain. So I showed you the value chain model earlier. We're talking to input suppliers, who's, who's producing the seeds, replicating the seeds, uh, the farmers obviously, but then there are agro processors and millers. This photo here is actually of a miller. Uh, so he's buying the rice from the farmers and milling it and putting it in sacks. This goes to retailers and then eventually to consumers. So what's the nature of this rice value chain? And in Burkina Faso, what's really important to know is that at the end of the day, this is an import substitution pro project. Burkina Faso only produces 25% of its own rice. And this is a major concern of the government, especially after uh, the global food crisis and the social unrest that was happening in um, uh, Burkina Faso's cities. So the goal here is to produce more rice so they don't have to import rice. And that's why we refer to it as an import substitution project. Now, what they did is they conducted surveys of consumers. They wanted to figure out what types of rice varieties do Burkina Bay consumers appreciate. Then they worked with seed breeders. And this is a photo of a seed breeder at a research station outside of the capital city, Ouagadougou, that we interviewed working with them to develop seeds that have these characteristics that are um, desired by consumers. Then they're working with seed firms who take those seeds, they replicate them um, and then sell them. There are other, other input providers, uh, the people who make and sell the pesticides, make and sell the fertilizers, farmers obviously, the traders, the agro-processors, the consumers. So what's the dynamic going on with these different actors? And this was interesting because this New Green Revolution project is working with all these different actors. It's providing them training, it's providing them loans, it's providing them grants to do their work. And what this means is that there's a network of these different individuals all along the value chain that are communicating with one another. Also, this project is operating in a variety of different African countries and many times they're receiving training in other countries. And so there's a network of these individuals across multiple African countries. And what this means is that, you know, this, this sort of force in numbers and they're very um, uh, enthusiastic about this particular approach to uh, addressing the problem that they perceive, which is underproduction. Okay, now, What's very interesting is that oftentimes when we think about the market in the United States and we think of you know, Adam Smith's sort of magic hand, we just assume that if there's a demand for a particular good that you know, uh, farmers will work hard to meet that demand and you know, millers will step into the void and process what they're producing and the inputs that are needed by the farmers, those will appear magically as well. That's not what's happening here. In fact, this project, the Alliance for a Green Revolution for Africa, actively 
is working with these different private sector entities to get them involved. It's sort of facilitating the linkages between them and it's helping them out. It's helping them mitigate risk in some instances. So for example, this guy on the right, who was the miller in the previous picture that I showed, he has made massive investments. He's actually building a new building here. He's invested in all this equipment and it's risky. He doesn't know if this is gonna work out. And so the, the, the project sort of actively supports him uh, in order to mitigate that risk. Now, this is not the case with all actors in the value chain. In many of the villages where we were, there were these small herbicide uh, sellers. They are springing up to sort of meet local demand and they're very much sort of operating their own on their own and they are not sort of actively supported by the project. At the consumer end, what's very interesting is that the market for local rice isn't really there, all right? Now, it's important to understand that traditional grains consumed in Burkina Faso are millet, sorghum, corn, or maize. And rice is kind of a new thing, and its demand has increased concomitant with urbanization. So urban populations are demanding rice more, it's easy to prepare, it's a labor-saving uh, way to cook, if you will, and it's also associated with modernization. So, you know, slick urban people consume rice. But Initially, this demand was always met by imported rice and people developed uh, a taste for that imported rice. And even though they're trying to produce local rice that meets the sort of taste requirements of uh, uh, urban consumers, it's been a real uphill battle. And so there's been a lot of advertising that's been done to try to reach the uber urban consumer. This is a sign in French along the major highway in Burkina Faso talking about how you know it tastes good, it's healthy, it's natural, it's fresh. It's nutrition, it's nutritional. But truth be told, we went to many different retail outlets and this local rice is, is hard to find. Um, and it has a lot to do with the fact that, that local consumers haven't really expressed a, a desire for it. Okay, so let's switch to the village level, all right? And remember, we're working in this, these five different villages where we interviewed women who are, some are participating in the project, some are not. The project, is actively facilitating links between these farmers and the input providers and the grain traders who would buy the grain from them and the millers, all right? And so they're constructing these relationships, these linkages. Uh, here's a sign for the project in the local language, uh, uh, Jula, in one of the, the project villages. And they're working with both male and female farmers in improved wetland areas. What does that mean? So these are a couple photos that I took in Medina Kura, which is that northernmost village. It's located along an arm of the Volta River, which was the old name of the country. And so these are seasonally flooded areas. They've gone in and they've leveled these areas. So they more evenly flood. They've, with village labor on the left here, you can see them constructing these small dikes and they're divided into quarter hectare plots where they then farm, okay? And so it's about getting people inputs, using the improved seeds, they're growing the rice, and then they're gonna sell it to uh, the traders. Now, this is some of the data we've collected from 2017. In particular, this, this was collected in the hungry season or the rainy season. And um, 161 um, women that were interviewed just to tell you a little bit about them, 53% are involved in the project, 72% um, uh, are in polygamous marriages, 96% have children, average age was 39, okay? And these are divided between rich, women in rich households, intermediate households, and poor households. Some are in the project, some are not in the project. If we look at this food insecurity access scale. Remember four is insecure, one is more secure. This is actually, these are pretty bad scores for a wealthier part of the country. So that was surprising. But if you take into account standard deviation, there is not a significant difference between women in the project and women out of the project. And this goes across all the different wealth groups. If we look at dietary diversity, we calculated this for the individual woman and then for their household. These scores were actually surprisingly high, and it probably has to do with the fact that we did this in the rainy season, 
or more foraged foods were available. These are higher scores. Um, you know, these are a number of different food groups that women are getting food from. These are higher scores and comparable research that's been done in northern Ghana. But again, there's no significant difference between women in the project and out of the project. So how do we explain this? Well, at the end of the day, it's only a quarter hectare plot of rice that they're growing with this project. They're doing lots of other things, so maybe it's not um, a big enough involvement. But we also encountered lots of other problems. So women in particular were having access, um, um, difficulty accessing loans or credits. They often had to work through a male relative. There were lots of land issues. And in fact, in some situations, when they developed these improved rice plots, this was land traditionally controlled by women and women were actually losing land as a result of the project. So those are some of the mitigating factors. The last thing I wanna talk about and I wanna highlight is some research that I've done with my students because you're a student, hopefully many of you will go on to, to uh, go to college and maybe you might contemplate a geography major. And these are some of the types of research that my students have been involved in the field closely connected with this project. And I wanna talk about the work of two students, Julia Morgan, who did a, a research project on foraging and Eliza Pessero, who did a research project on herbicide use. And this is actually Eliza featured here. She's interviewing a local woman and she's with one of my Burkina Bay research assistants. So foraging, this work done by Julia Morgan. So based on additional surveys we did, we discovered that there are about 25 different species of non-cultivated plants, as well as insects that are important sources of nutrition. This includes uh, this, an insect, a caterpillar, which is a really important source of protein. 92% uh, of women reported that they thought this forage food was really important for food security and nutrition. And 91% of women had actually consumed some of these forage foods in the last 24 hours. And so this, there's a strong correlation between level of foraging activity and dietary diversity. And this research is actually, Julie and I recently published this in an article, so she's a published author now. Last thing I wanna talk about is herbicide use. And this is work that currently my student Eliza Pessero and I are writing up. So 92% of the women in our sample reported using uh, herbicides. This is way up from about 10 to 15 years ago. They apply these herbicides one to seven times per season, but most frequent, most on average about two times. Um, women are often um, uh, using male relatives to apply the herbicides. And this is a picture of a guy with a backpack sprayer applying herbicides in a rice field. And on average, they started using these herbicides about seven to eight years ago. And there are a variety of reasons that they're using them. One is that they're much more affordable than they used to be. The other is that they're facing labor constraints and weeding takes a lot of labor. So this is a labor saving technology. Um, they've noticed that um, re weeds are more of a problem now than they used to be. So they need the help of um, um, herbicides. And in some cases, older women um, really, you know, they don't have as much physical strength as they used to. So this is a way uh, to, to help them out. And so Eliza and I sort of working hypothesis about why we've seen this dramatic increase in herbicides is that it's is related to gender. So if you think about men and women in a household, and in this social context, women have sort of less power, which means they have less control over labor. And so herbicides are a labor-saving technology. Secondly, more globally, there's been a huge increase in generic herbicide production. So herbicides have gone off patent and we've seen a big increase in production in places like India and China. And so now they're just much more affordable than they used to be. They used to be completely out of reach of, of a lot of poor farmers. And then the third factor is more regional. There's been an upsurge in artisanal gold mining and a lot of young women and men are leaving farms which further constrains the pool of laborers, which is a particular problem for women. So women's increasing use of herbicides is a very re res uh, rational response to labor constraints. We don't wanna blame them, but there are serious concerns about this. Glyphosate, which is a key ingredient in a lot of herbicides is a, a probable carcinogen. And we've also seen the increase in herbicide-resistant weeds. So to conclude, 
Um, the new green revolution for Africa is, you can see evidence of it in Burkina Faso, all right? These value chains have been in, sort of constructed, if you will. There are these private sector actors that are involved with them, but unfortunately there's been very little evidence of improving food security and dietary diversity on the ground of the women involved with these, okay? The private sector is very central to this initiative, but what's curious about this is that their sort of involvement in a sense has to be orchestrated by this project. It's not sort of naturally happening, which reminds us in a way of colonial efforts to sort of introduce capitalism to the African continent and having to go through all sorts of machinations to get it to work the way they want, all right? Thirdly, it is interesting how influential agronomists and seed breeders are in this initiative. And oftentimes in the face of lackluster demand for this product, there's a real insistence on a particular way of farming, on standardization, on using high quality seeds. And so in many ways, this is you know, an example of modernization. Like we need to have this done in a particular way that resembles you know, farming as it's done in the West. And then lastly, there are lots of other things happening at the local level, including foraging activity, which turns out to be really important for dietary diversity, as well as this massive upsurge in herbicide use. And finally, I just wanna acknowledge my funder, the National Science Foundation. I am working with four other scientists in the United States who are pictured here on the bottom, and we're working in three different countries. Um, I'm responsible for the work in uh, Burkina Faso. I want to thank my team on the ground in Burkina Faso, the Burkina Bay graduate students, uh, Burkina Bay scientists I'm collaborating with, and my many students that I've worked with. And then last, lastly, institutionally, the Burkina Faso National Institute for Environment and Agricultural Research has been a key partner in this effort. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture.